Hello everyone and welcome to my Six Converge presentation. This is the first one I've ever done and it's the first time I've presented at any sort of um, real Cyrix event for want of a better word. I've never presented at Synergy because I'm terrified of aeroplanes and therefore I can't often get to Synergy unless Cyrix decide to bring it back in Europe, which would be nice. Um, anyway, Cyrix Converge 2020. I know Converge is nominally kind of aimed at developers usually, but I'm just uh, what you might consider a, a common or garden Citrix consultant. But what I am very keen to do is to share a journey that I went on during the COVID-19 lockdown. Most importantly, what I want to try and show is how we've had to adapt the old processes that we used to support our users into a new norm, for want of a better term, I'm sure. Everyone is sick of hearing that phrase by now, the new normal, but for IT, that's really what it has become. What we've had to do is accelerate our transformation to a new model in, for a lot of us, in a really disruptive way. So I hope you will find some, some usefulness in the, the story of how we managed it. Just before I start, uh, a little bit of information about me. I am a current Citrix CTP. I have been since 2018. Um, I work with a lot of customers across quite a few verticals, but I've been mainly, and for the duration of this project really, working within financial services. Um, I've got quite a good presence online where I sort of blog a lot at james-rankin.com. Hopefully um, some of you out there in the Citrix world may have read one or two of my articles. I do have a YouTube channel as well, um, which I'd be love if anybody could come along and subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube and search for James Rankin, you'll find there's one who's a pilot who has some really exciting videos about flying. It's the other one you want, that's me. So maybe not as exciting, but hopefully infinitely more useful to the people out there who work within information technology. Um, also, I have to say props to all the other CTPs and users on the World of EUC Slack channel who, when I was researching this presentation, helped me out with some of the stories of their experience as well. So a lot of other people's experiences have fed into this presentation, so thank you very much for those people for their contributions. So, I'll just start talking firstly here about the, the PMO environment that I was working in when COVID-19 came along, the, the, the present method of operation, as it were. As I said, I work mainly in one particular vertical, and the estate that I was working in could quite easily be described as traditional, right? Got lots of laptops and desktops, managed mainly by System Center Config Manager, all of your applications installed directly onto the devices. So you see on the right hand side here, we've got big corporate offices that are all very well managed and very well protected, users with static devices in there or laptops connecting up to the corporate resources within their data center. So lots of things in there, their applications, their data, databases, AD, email, SharePoint, all sorts of apps and all the SCCM infrastructure that managed it together. Now, anybody that worked remotely, some of you have got your kind of mobile workers, the standard way of connection there was to connect up via a VPN. They came in via VPN and then connected up to the corporate network and ran all of their applications that way. There was some Citrix apps in there on hosted farms, but generally not very many. Most of it is all done from a desktop or a laptop using VPN. We also had down at the bottom here a lot of what we call GSPs, which were global service providers. So essentially people who had been, you know, their other providers that provided users who ran certain processes for the business. Now these were actually Citrix users, quite a lot of them, but the way they connected up was basically by coming over um, dedicated MPLS lines from specific locations, connecting up and then running Citrix apps from the Citrix farms once they'd connected up through the VPN that way. So... The VPN that we had there, you know, 
the capacity of it wasn't great, neither was the performance. So when it first looked like back in March of 2019 that we were going to get a coronavirus, March of 2020, March of 2020 even, <laughs> when we looked like we were going to get a coronavirus lockdown, there was quite a bit of a, a stir, for want of a better word, about how this might be managed. As I said, the VPN simply couldn't accommodate every single user and those that could be on there were looking at a decrease in the performance quality. Now for users that were office bound, um, the process of procuring and building laptops that met the required specifications suffered from a long lead time, so long that it would have a significant business impact. And especially with all of these offshore users out there, where the performance again wasn't great at the best of times, it might be safe to say that we were kind of a bit unprepared for the coronavirus lockdown and what that might mean for us. So it meant that, if, if you will, the first lesson learned that to fail to prepare is to prepare to fail. But in all fairness, I'm sure that there are many, many enterprises that found themselves in the same boat. They found themselves with a very traditional way of managing their environment, traditional devices, limited remote working capability, and all of a sudden they were starting to think, what happens if everybody has to work remotely? So, it started to look like we were going to have to make a rapid and very unprecedented move to remote working. The first thing we needed to understand about this was what requirements that we had. Now, obviously, any solution that we put in would need to scale up and possibly down as well at a very rapid pace. All of those user applications that all of those users out at those GSPs and in all of these offices across the world needed to be available. There was no chance that we could say we could only have half of them available. We would affect the business drastically from a financial perspective. As always, you know, when you talk to people about providing a remote access solution or some work from home capability, they tell you that the performance has to be as good as or better than the current solution that they're using. Now also, bearing in mind that this is a financial services environment, security needs to be very, very tight. Now especially, there was a lot of concern from our CISO about the prospect of unmanaged devices, particularly with those offshore users for the GSPs. You know, you don't want to have unmanaged devices in locations like that, that you have absolutely no control over. So security suddenly moved right up the menu. And also, because we are making such a big shift in the amount of users, the support for those users needs to be very easy to access and very thorough as well. Let's not forget we're potentially talking about users, moving users into a situation where they have no peers to consult with. They can't just talk to the guy next to them and find out what they need to do or what they're doing wrong. Their support has to be provided almost completely remotely. Now, fortunately for this particular estate, where, as I said, their current way of remote working couldn't support all of their users, there was something sitting in the background that gave them a bit of a, a get out of jail free card. It was actually a small project that I'd been working on, which was initially intended to provide virtual desktops to a very small number of offshore developers, around three to 500. And it ran on Citrix Cloud with the workers in Amazon Web Services. Now, also fortunately, I'd kind of been left alone really to sort of tinker with it for about eight months or so. It was kind of my little pet project that I'd had going, and I was kind of almost given a bit of carte blanche to try and make it you know, work the way I wanted it to. So I had actually started tweaking it to support rapid, up, rapid upscaling and rapid application deployment. And I was working on a lot of security enhancements because I was very aware that this solution needed to be secure. But I, I, I wasn't being prescient here. I didn't think it was going to be scaled up. I was actually considering a bit of a personal crusade to try and get more companies working from home rather than in the office. And I was intending to use this as kind of the test bed to show how the performance of a virtual desktop in the cloud could be comparable to that of a physical device. So when COVID-19 came along and the lockdown also came along, fortunately for this customer, they already had a small tried and tested environment 
that could be used to host many thousands of users. Essentially, I was kind of sat there in the background with my hand up saying, you know, you don't need to go look at lots of other solutions. We may have a solution for you. You see on this diagram here, you can see how it was intended to work. We have our users who, for this case, you know, before it was scaled up were purely offshore. They would use their clients, which would either be a third party managed device or an unmanaged device even. And the difference is, rather than using those MPLS leased lines, they could come in over the public internet. From there, they'd hit the gateway service, which handed off and got all of the authentication done through Azure AD and conditional access, and also had Azure multi-factor authentication there as well. So once authenticated, they were passed into the Zen App and Zen Desktop Service, obviously, which is now called Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktop Service, within Citrix Cloud. And within AWS, we had a two-tiered kind of operation. We had um, full fat VDI instances for the developers to work on, which was segregated so they couldn't connect to production data because that was a requirement. And we also had for them to use things like email and Skype and things like that, we had a hosted shared desktop. So not a dedicated desktop, but a hosted ZenApp desktop, which then gave them those kind of office tools. So the, the benefits of it were, were that it had anywhere access, obviously. So uh, as I said, instead of relying on dedicated connections and VPN, full cloud service that could be accessed from anywhere with public internet. Now at the time we started building this actually for posterity, Windows Virtual Desktop wasn't actually released and Amazon Workspaces was still a bit, to be frank, immature. So that's mainly why we adopted Citrix Cloud. However, Given that a lot of the offshore users, other people within the business and IT support staff were already very familiar with the Citrix client as a way of accessing apps and desktops because we had on-premises and hosted Citrix environments, it would have been our product of choice even with that competition there, I would have thought. Citrix is fairly well embedded within this customer. It made a lot of sense to go through it. Obviously, from a security perspective, we've ticked the box multi-factor authentication. Azure AD, Microsoft Authenticator there, satisfied that number one security concern around remote working. Now, getting your users used to using NFA is one of the first things we have to adapt our support to. It's very important to communicate new ways of working to your users so that it becomes second nature to them and support staff have an important role to play here. We also had Office 365 connectivity from these um, VDI and hosted shared desktops as well via express route so all of the users office apps were available in that hosted shared desktop. As I said it was segregated so another security requirement that production and non-production data couldn't spill into each other. It was managed completely disparately that was again ticked and the Citrix policies gave us good control of how data could be moved between those environments when we used GPUs from the on-premises AD to provide further security controls there as well. Now, almost a, a kind of an added bonus, really, that we had from this sort of setup, was if you look here, we could access the NetScaler gateway, which represented access to some of our on-premises and hosted Citrix environments. So the pressure wasn't really huge for us to deliver all applications into that cloud environment because we could simply double hop across and use things from those hosted environments as well. Now, obviously, longer term, it would make more sense to put cloud connectors in there as well and present them all through that sort of Citrix workspace portal. But just from a case of getting people up and running, presenting that NetScaler gateway there really took the pressure off us when it came to delivering all of those applications. Now, I'd also worked quite extensively with the cloud operations teams to produce a reliable way of doing rapid scaling and rapid application updating. And we'll talk more about that in the next slide because that's one of the, the, the bits where I thought this solution really shot. So anyway, when the, the time came for lockdown and everyone was all of a sudden in a blind panic about it, as I said, I was the one with my hand in the air saying, we might have a suitable solution already. And it ticked a lot of the boxes that I know they would be looking to get ticked. So I had a bit of a head start on everyone. We'd already done some of those hard yards. So obviously when we looked to adopt this, what happened was I had to go and answer a lot of difficult questions on an architectural level about how we were going to manage and deploy this. So first let's talk about how we managed to provision a rapid scaling platform. This 
in terms of COVID-19 is one of the most important lessons to learn. That to provide a service that can be adapted rapidly, I mean, especially as international rules change independently of each other and users can be sent home in their droves at any given moment, you need to be able to scale up and down at an unparalleled rate of knots. I mean, let's just look at the UK. We have Wales, Scotland and England and Ireland all operating on different kind of uh, guidelines. So it became very, very important. Now, the first thing to talk about is we didn't actually use MCS for this. There was a couple of reasons for this. The first one was that our security team had blocked access to the Citrix API gateway. So MCS wouldn't work, actually. But using MCS, even if we had been able to use it, didn't give us real control over where we could place the workers once they were provisioned. So we actually adopted it through our cloud principles. Provisioning method involved using Packer, Terraform, Puppet and chocolatey. And we went down this, you know, on the principle that one of the biggest blockers to rapid deployment is the fact that endpoints need to be patched with operating system hotfixes and application updates. Now, usually this depends on the worker being provisioned, booted up, contacting a WSOSO or an SCCM server, downloading and installing the updates, installing its applications from SCCM, its application updates, and then restarting potentially multiple times. This can be very time consuming, sometimes it can go wrong. You've got huge Windows cumulative updates now, all very, very time consuming. But if you look, what we did was essentially we kind of almost handed this off to Amazon. Amazon are very good that not long after Patch Tuesday, they will, re re they will release a new golden AMI, an Amazon machine image. And this has all of the latest patches already installed. Now, there is a principle of joint responsibility here. That means you must check. Amazon are not going to take responsibility if you get exploited because you failed to check. But I have to say that in our time doing this, we never really found vital patches missing from it. So the first stage, the AMI is released, and we then provision a the machine and run a compliance scan to ensure that all those expected patches are installed. Now, once the images are produced and scanned, if they don't meet the scan, then they, there is a WSUS server standing by to apply some patches. But 99% of the time, this didn't need to be uh, done. That AMI would then be sys prepped, and the images were produced in staging via Packer code, which then automatically creates the number of instances that we've requested in that pipeline, and then deploys them along with all the tool sets that we need to go on them. Then the core applications are installed by chocolatey scripts, which have a switch that allows you to do what's called an evergreen install. So instead of pointing to an internal repository that we have to update ourselves, it goes up to the chocolatey online repositories and retrieves the latest possible version. Again, you're relying on chocolatey to update their repositories. They don't do it instantly. Obviously there's some checking involved, but generally within a week ago, a week or so, you will find that those applications that are applied via chocolatey are at the latest possible versions. It then has a machine restart initiated out of all, after all these applications are installed, and they finish booting up as part of the shutdown script. Again, it's joined to the domain, and then as they join to the domain, they are given a huge GPO PowerShell startup script that runs. And what this does is it actually dynamically creates the entire user environment. So there's no need to rely on policies for branding or default profiles or anything like that, or things like FS Logics rule sets. They're all dynamically created by this single PowerShell script that then runs. And this is another part of it that's absolutely great. Again, we have to update this script occasionally as changes are made, but the amount of errors that are removed because we know exactly that this script's going to run, what it's going to do, if anything goes wrong, we simply go back and check through for errors, find them. It works absolutely brilliantly. After that, we also use a thing called the AppV Scheduler. Wait, well, it used to be called the AppV Scheduler. It's now called AppV Intix. The agent for that starts, and what that does is it pulls down a load of AppV packages from file share. The non-core apps are delivered via AppV, and they're synchronized from a file share. The cache down to the worker obviously needs a lot of storage, but the benefits of this is we don't have to wait for the monthly rebuilds, because um, these are rebuilt every single month, every single one of these servers. 
We don't have to wait for that monthly rebuild if we need to update one of those applications. We can simply update the package within that file share and the next time the machine runs a synchronization, it then pulls down the latest version. We can do that in session. You can deploy new non-core apps to the users within the session and it uses FSLogix app masking on top of that to restrict the access to those applications. Like I just said there, after that's done, the FSLogix agent starts, the FSLogix rules provide those application controls. Now, at this stage, we're just about done. We then have a second stage compliance scan, which is run, which checks vulnerabilities, patch levels, the configuration of the security tools. It must score over 90% at this stage in order for it to be released and then joint to the catalog and the delivery group. We're currently scoring about 92% here. We're aiming for 94, but over 90% they're allowed to be released. And at that point, it is then released into the environment and it's available for log on. And this process, I cannot um, build it up enough. It works absolutely excellently. When I first saw how we had to do these things, I really, really kind of went, oh my God, this is never going to work. It's so unfamiliar. And it works absolutely brilliantly. I, it is almost completely hands off. We don't have to use SCCM because you know we, we want the, the flexibility of having a single image and being able to deliver lots of different apps to different sets of users from that single image. This gives us that kind of control. We have the chocolatey installs for the core apps, the app v schedule which pulls down the non-core apps, then FSLogic sits on top of it and then provisions those apps to users who are entitled to them. It also means that the possibility for error, for human error within this process is greatly reduced. Now, it is obviously possible for there to be a human error because there is some human involvement and at one point we did accidentally rebuild all of the Citrix infrastructure servers instead of the Citrix worker servers which caused a little bit of a disruption but as I said the amount of errors that could possibly happen because it's all so automated are greatly greatly reduced. And that's what we're going to talk about just here about the benefits of this rapid scale methodology. As I said, no patching is required. We have to do a check, but we don't have to do any patching. Imagine how much time you save not doing patching. Every single one of these workers is rebuilt every 30 days. They're all torn down on a monthly basis and rebuilt. So even if you've got some advanced persistent threat that manages to fly under your radar into here, it has a lifespan of 30 days, no more, no less. All those core apps are automatically updated. You can see the uh, switch there within chocolatey, pull in the latest possible version. The non-core applications can be updated on the fly by updating that central file share. Next poll runs the cooldown. It's a single image, which is great. This is the first environment I've ever worked in that has a single image. You have security controls, all of that user environment set up, you know, branding, legal notice, default profile, start tiles, layouts, bits of things like BG info. There are no external reliances from there. It's all created dynamically by the post build config script. We used to observe build processes that failed because of a failure of an external reliance, you know, a file copy failed or something like that, a folder getting copied down became corrupted, but this dependency is totally gone. We just use base64 in PowerShell to create them on the fly and it works absolutely perfectly. And as I said, margin of error is greatly reduced. We also use this rapid deployment method and teardown model for infrastructure components as well. The cloud connectors, the RDSH license servers, the file servers are all built there. If you were doing it on premises, you could easily extend that to desktop delivery controllers, storefront, things like that. It's absolutely great and I really love it. And I never thought I would say that, but this is the way to deploy your images now, especially in a cloud environment. It's absolutely excellent. Now, what we also did was we had to produce a kind of, within this monthly rebuild process, a testing process. And I think it's very important to have at least four tiers of testing that you run through. And you see from this diagram here, which is a bit, possibly a bit overcomplicated for the point I'm trying to make is though that within the dev environment, when we first build the new servers, we release them to dev straight away. And within there, we have automated users, which I'll talk more about on the test slide, running various tests and feeding back any errors or any problems or any uptick in KPIs. You know, does the logon time increase? Does application launch time increase? And once we find those defects and things like that, 
we feed them back in, we fix them, and then we always automate the fix that goes in there. Whether it's you know making a change to the scripts or the install scripts or the config scripts or even applying a policy or something like that, that's all fed in. Once we're satisfied with the build in dev, because dev is a bit of a sandboxy environment, we then pass it in with all of the fixes into UAT. And again, UAT is done primarily by automated users but on a much larger scale to ensure that we're also testing the load on there and the user density that we can do. If nothing comes through, well or if anything does come through from UAT, we pass it back, fail it, rebuild it again and pass them through. But then we go to pre-production which is normally a week before full deployment and this is where we actually have real users. What we do is we have a bunch of users that are allocated to pre-prod on a rolling basis and what happens there is they know any problems that they get within that testing week, they have to report it specifically to the operations teams. And once pre-prod passes, we then roll it out to production. Old images are torn down, new images are stood up, users don't notice any difference, they just notice that the version number has incremented, and we go back to beginning the testing phase again. It's a very, very DevOpsy model, and again, it works great. But the point to make is that it's a rolling process. We always need to be going ahead and continuing with this. It never stops. We're in a constant state of testing and rebuild. What you need to do, what is vitally important, is you get out of this old mindset. You all know what it is. You know, there's a small version update to Chrome, and then you've got to spend six weeks testing back and forth and filling forms in and talking to users and getting them to run processes again. Stop that right now. For this COVID world that we're in, where everybody's remote and we need to scale up and down and have new applications deployed rapidly, we need to be in a rolling state of rebuild that involves constant testing. And as I said, a four-tiered model is the best if you can get it. Now, like I said there, talking about automated user testing, in order to be able to perform the dev and UAT testing more effectively and not get bogged down for long periods of time by constant cycling through contact with users and testing processes, it's incredibly vital that you adopt automation as part of your testing process. Like I said, the pre-production stage, the pre-production phase should always be done by real users, not synthetic ones, but quality automated testing allows us to advance into that pre-production phase much more quickly and adopt a really agile, speedy and predictable testing process. It allows us to identify changes in load and density at an early stage. And as I said, identify if key business processes are impacted by updates and changes in any way. We also need to be able to spot and react to errors within that automated testing process. Now it's nice to call out here, I've been doing some work with a product called AppLoader from Automy, which allows you to record various testing processes and then launch up to thousands of users, synthetic users, who will attach to your Citrix workers and run those tests according to that schedule. I find this kind of RPA testing, robotic process automation testing, really handy. I can tell almost instantly whether a change to an application affects my KPIs. If there's a new version of Chrome, for instance, in the dev image, I can tell straight away, you know, whether I've got hundreds of SaaS apps that users access, and I tell straight away if there's a problem, because I just fire a load of test users, and they iterate through each one of those, and launch sessions, and log into them. And if there's an error, as you can see from this at the bottom here, it will report back to you at what stage of that testing script it has actually failed in a GUI interface. So I find this really, really, really handy. This data also feeds into our monitoring systems, so that the performance data that comes from these synthetic users is fed into our monitoring systems, which are back-ended by Splunk, and we can compare the performance straight away against those existing baselines. So if again, if a change to an application or a policy or something increases the logon or the application launch time, I don't waste any time finding it out, it's there instantly. I don't have to contact testers, wait for them to run their processes, document the results and feed it back and then investigate. I've got an army of robotic users who run the tests in minutes and all that stuff is logged for me straight away. So it's very important to adapt your processes to automate so much more of this testing. RPA tools like Automide, there are others available obviously, but this is the one that I've used are invaluable.
make sure that your, that your update and your testing processes are also brought in to the new world, right? We haven't got weeks to spend. We've got a month to deploy from end to end till we start with the next one. So automate as much of those dev and UAT processes as you possibly can. So there you go. It's a DevOps approach that we need to scaling and deployment and testing as well. You've got to rapidly increase those user numbers, rapidly update applications. Obviously, cloud services make all of this easier, but you know you can do this for on-premises as well. I know people who have done it. I've watched presentations by them. But it gives you such a rapid response. We got told that our Indian users, who five or 6,000 users, were going to have to work from home. We got 24 hours notice for that. Now, in our hosted environments, that would have taken a week to stand up the new workers to accommodate them because we needed a thousand new workers. We didn't lose a full working week. We scaled at 1,080 devices, uh, 1,080 workers per hour. That is how much we did. They were done in one hour. We scaled up. And I'm very, very proud. I mean, it's the cloud ops teams who did most of the magic around this. I'm not um, claiming any credit for them. That's like Deepak and Satish and all the guys who work on this with me. I've done a really great job with it. And I'm very, very proud of it. it in fact, it's the first Citrix implementation I've ever done where there is no reboot schedule in place. The only time these servers are restarted is when they are torn down and replaced. So essentially, they're not restarted at all. Now, when it comes back to making sure you've got every application available, this is a tricky subject and one I keep coming back to. You have to have a deep, deep understanding of your users in terms of what applications they use and how they use them. You need to understand their ways of working. And in a disparate environment like this, it's very, very difficult to document all of that. Monitoring as an ongoing process is absolutely vital. You can't just ask them, you've got to try and understand. Nobody has an exhaustive list of their day-to-day -day applications and URLs. And many users don't understand how they're doing things. This is where proactive monitoring becomes king. I mean, if you want to understand everything about your applications, this is what you'd want to understand. The more you can get, the better. The more you can get that from an automated way, the better. You, you can't cover everything, but you need to make sure that you've got a monitoring tool, you know, something like Director or Citrix Analytics, or there's many other third party tools out there that will give you a fighting chance of knowing about 60, 80% of your use cases. Even if you're cross-referencing these things with documented records or vendor best practices, get them all documented. There's a couple of examples to call out. We have Bloomberg as one of the applications, which when I looked at it, it seemed simple enough to install. And then I went and um, spoke to a few people about it and looked at the minimum requirements of the application and I had to make a significant rethink in the spec of the workers to provide for these users. There's also something like we had PowerShell blocked in this environment. But then when we looked at the statistics from our desktop estate before we moved people across, we realized there were a big subset of users who actually used PowerShell for crunching data in their day-to-day -day work process. So this is where you need to understand all of these things. You need to be able to quickly and easily adapt as well. And you also need to always be testing the next iteration of your build. You know, some users use applications seasonally and in a COVID type situation, new application requests spring up almost constantly. You've got to be able to get it done and you've got to have some form of monitoring to give you the data that allows you to respond to this. Quality monitoring makes a huge difference in so many areas. Take it up as soon as possible. As I said, Citrix have monitoring tools. You can roll your own if you're familiar with things like Power BI. You've got all sorts of third party tools out there. Uber Agent, Control Up, Goliath Technologies, EG Innovations. There are loads of Citrix partners out there that can do this. Get monitoring in your environment. In a remote environment where all your users are remote without monitoring, you are blind. Not just to reactive problems, but also understanding where the next application request is going to come from. What if users are trying to use something and they can't because of security policies? Monitoring, auditing, baselining, and trending is utterly crucial. So the next kind of stage, once you've scaled up that environment, once you've got that infrastructure prepared, the next challenge is getting the users on board. And this was a very big challenge, particularly with a globally diverse user base. First thing we did was make sure we set up a dedicated team 
that were equipped specifically to deal with user onboarding to the remote solution. And we got the contact details for that team known everywhere by communicating it very heavily. We put it out on the platform itself, on the workspace page, the published desktop background, emails. We made sure everybody was aware of it. But also think about collateral. Remote working for a lot of people, right, is a big cultural shift, you know. And one thing we quickly realized is that user guides, you know, via PDF and frequently asked questions documents, even when they're, they're linked up particularly well, most users just don't read them. But what we found that people respond to were quick, to the point, punchy video guides. I've fallen in this trap a few times on my YouTube channel where I spend a long time waxing lyrical about something, trying to cover every possible eventuality. And this doesn't resonate with people at all. When you want to build up their confidence and capability with a new solution, they want something short, direct, and to the point that shows them the pertinent areas quickly and with a minimum of fuss. Most UI tools are fairly intuitive anyway. Users just need to be getting into the right area. And this is a great tool. Quick, professional-looking instruction videos are far easier to make than you might think. If you've got any team members even vaguely familiar with things like Camtasia or Adobe After Effects, or Probably not a Adobe After Effects, actually. That's pretty complicated. But anything like Camtasia or, or, or Snagit or something like that, get them to start making video, you know, how-to videos straight away. Sometimes you don't have the time to spend with them on a call doing a step-by-step -step walkthrough. If you can point them at a video that's easily available, absolutely invaluable. We've got great responses to this. They cut down a load of help desk calls, which again, we looked at by crunching the data that we were receiving based around the users that we already had using the system. Again, keep banging this drum. Monitoring is vital. Understand what problems are affecting your users. Target the common issues for collateral that can help them. It's also important to make sure that your response team, your support team, are comfortable with thinking outside the box when it comes to user issues. Now the problems that we had before COVID are not the same as the ones we have after. Most of them are now to do with the user's ISP or their local setup rather than our infrastructure. A lot of people have often got kids at home, they're sharing connection with people who are working for other companies, they're contending on the same broadband. So the role of the first responders comes to be often to be to find quick workable solutions to usually connectivity challenges. So you're dealing with Wi-Fi interference, you're helping users run wired connections or switching to tethering. These are all things that the support team need to adapt to. We had a lot of users in India that had very, very poor connectivity and support teams were wasting a lot of time trying to troubleshoot Citrix sessions in the traditional way when really they needed to look at the data that showed some of them on like I think we had one guy on 60,000 milliseconds latency. But even Citrix is not going to work well over that. So cut down to the bone, get him somewhere where he's got better internet connectivity and run it again from there. It's very important to change that focus to think outside of the box, as I said. What we did find a great help in these situations was to publish tools within the user session that allowed the users to diagnose their own issues. So for instance, things that help them monitor their network connectivity. We used the HDX monitor inside the session. We, 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 we told them how to use speed testing tools on the client, which again was backed up by punchy quick videos, allowing them to assess their own network connectivity and did they need to do something about it. We also got dashboards that we publish, you know, like the Six Cloud dashboard that lets you see if there's an issue, you know, is there an ongoing outage or service degradation? So don't need to phone the help desk if you already know how it's out. Um, we published things like BG Info that showed things that were helpful to support teams. And we also put a lot of our um, own sort of stuff, service components into a Splunk dashboard that the users could access. For instance, things like MFA. Is MFA up or is MFA down? You know, that might be why you can't go log in. Again, more tools using things like incognito mode. A lot of our users had devices that were joined to other Azure ADs and you can't let workspace um, double up on that when you're using the web client. So there was a lot of stuff we could do. As I said, BG Info uh, for our full fat VDI users, we give them the option to restart their own machines. And the, the you know, a lot of people traditionally 
have shied away from giving their users help desk tools because they're very worried that they'll just use them as a sledgehammer um, for every nut they need to crack. But really, all of a sudden, under COVID-19, these self-help tools are really, really, really invaluable. The more self-help you can give to them, the more difference you can make to the quality of the service. We did things like um, how to reset passwords and MFA tokens reset. We published out all of this as well. Give the users the tool to help themselves and let them learn how to you know, make sure they're on a, a decent workspace app client, that they've got good network connectivity, that they're, that they're not running a Windows XP machine or something crazy like that. That's why what leads me into is that once, you know, like I said, you don't want to open up your users by saying anybody can connect from any device. You need to have some minimum standards. And we did have to set some standards. We had to send out documentation and videos that helped out here. Obviously, if you're managing your own net skills, your own ADCs, you can use things like endpoint analysis. But as we were in cloud, we didn't have that option, not yet, anywhere. So again, monitoring comes very much to the fore here. Again, we needed to target those users, so we need to look at the metrics, find the users that are using very old workspace app versions, and get them upgraded. Again, don't forget, we didn't have management of a lot of these devices. So we had to make sure that we initiated their own support teams to try and get them updated. Again, if they're sitting on the end of very slow network connections and they're trying to push an update to a laptop via SCCM, it's not going to work very well. Um, we also had to be quite strict when it came down to things like MacBooks and Linux-based clients and iPads and things like that because, again, our support teams weren't really used to dealing with these things. And again, we had to make sure that they were trained in troubleshooting these things. Enforcement of patch levels and antivirus still became a very big issue. Citrix does give you um, a certain amount of protection against this through some of their policies, but the spectrum of things like keyloggers on compromised client devices looms big. We are still waiting for app protection to come to cloud. Um, those of you using on-premises systems can leverage that right now. That's why it's very important to keep workspace app versions up to date. Citrix are being quite good. They're bringing out more and more security features and we want to get on those as soon as possible, which is why you need to make sure those workspace app versions are very up to date. As I said, Citrix appear to be embracing the security side of things with this remote working, bringing a lot of value to the table and I'm very pleased with some of the new things I see coming through as well from them. We also use data and monitoring to identify common config errors, you know, users with inaccessible home folder paths, inaccessible drive mappings and things like that. Why are you still using drive mappings? I hate drive mappings. Um, again, we identified the early, took the resolutions from the support calls, used them to drive changes to the onboarding process to ensure that users, as we moved on, we were learning from what had happened previously. There's also um, the importance of video came very much to the fore when we start talking about the user session. So once we've got them onboarded, we start talking about the session themselves. During COVID, video provision has taken on a huge leap of importance. Prior to COVID, I'd hazard a guess and say when it came to video issues within Citrix sessions, normally you would kind of get a response, well, why do you need to use video calling? If you've got audio, you're in the office, you can screen share, it's absolutely fine. However, now video is absolutely important because besides helping people collaborate, the interaction provided by being able to see people's faces is vital to stop people feeling isolated. So the provision of quality responsive video, I mean, if that audio and video is disjointed, you lose that human connection, it's absolutely crucial. Now there's loads of technologies that um, are used to video sharing, Zoom, BlueJeans, etc. Teams seems to be very prevalent as the tool of choice. Microsoft have done very well. Um, with teams during coronavirus. So we had to adjust our support processes very quickly to ensure that teams in particular could provide performant, reliable video and audio connection. To maximize teams performance, number one, make sure you get it installed correctly. Use the all user and the all user switches or you'll end up in a world of hell. We accidentally allowed the auto updater to run and believe me, you don't want to go there. Application crashes, disconnects. I've got a good guide link there that tells you how to install it properly. There's also underneath a link to Manuel's um, GitHub where it tells you how to uninstall the user-based version of Teams if you accidentally get in there. You do things like turn off GPU if you're not using GPU, which will improve your performance. Get the latest versions of the Citrix VDA and the Citrix Workspace app. Offloading is absolutely crucial to being able to deliver good Teams video performance. 
If you can't, your user density is going to suffer. If you can't use offloading, consider using Citrix browser content redirection to redirect the web client version instead, although that is tricky. So if you can, make sure you get the offloading running. Citrix, expand the offloading. So vital that you get your Citrix versions updated so you can use the HDX optimization. For managing teams, use FS Logics, configure an exclusion for cached storage. If you look at my website, the team's articles on there will tell you all about those things and it'll save you lots and lots of disk space. Another thing to talk about is again help the users to help themselves. A lot of Teams issues can be solved just by teaching the users to close it properly as it shows in the top right image there. So instead of just clicking the X, use the quit from the system tray. Also a thing to get them in the habit is the, uh, the, the image underneath that. Make sure they get in the habit of checking that their actual video and audio devices are connected correctly. That will save you lots of problems. Usually if they're not, the answer is close Teams the way that you've showed them. Citrix and Microsoft are constantly releasing Teams updates, so make sure you keep up to date with those versions as well. If you're stuck on LTSR, it can be very difficult. So get agile, get updating, become much more, much more able to shift very rapidly to new versions. So like I said, video is now massively important and it's up to you to ensure as an architect, consultant, support team that you're ready to provide the best possible video performance. Another thing to think about is that now your virtual platform is your primary user platform, right? So any performance degradation there is going to impact the business. Prior to this, our users just used odd Citrix apps from hosted platforms. Now they're using Citrix all the time. So we need to make sure that every last bit of performance is eked out of it. Identify your hardest hitting applications. Again, did anybody say monitoring? I'll tell you what they are, they're Teams and Chrome. <laughs> Optimize them as much as you possibly can in line with the vendor and community guidelines. Constant baselining and testing. This is where things like Automite can help as well. That RPA style of testing, you can instantly see if there's a degradation or a problem. Resource and bandwidth is now absolutely vital because you need all of that for your bloody video calling requirements. Go after quick wins like turning off Chrome hardware acceleration if you need to, browser content redirection, ad blockers, everything like that, right? As IT admins, every last bit of performance now counts. You want that user density to be as good as possible. You want that user experience to be great. Data access, uh, yeah, use OneDrive if you've got server 2019 or up on your workers, use files on demand and storage sense, things like that. Use FS Logics, monitoring again, monitor your networks, make sure you're not impacting your network connectivity out there. Also, I think from a COVID-19 perspective, monitoring what your users are doing is very key. But this is not just a micromanagement to make sure that everybody's doing their work, right? I think it's also important to think about, are your users working too long? Or are they changing their working patterns? Are they, for instance, working more in the evenings and taking care of kids during the day? Do you then need to make changes to support hours around that? So monitoring on this level is not necessarily a force for evil. You need to pay real attention to the trends in how your users are connecting. And again, you don't want them to work too long. You don't want them to get burned out. But if you see how they're using the system, you can then tweak the performance for them to match their new user activities that have changed quite rapidly. We see lots more users working in the evenings, 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. And we have had to put it into a situation there where we now have to stand up more workers outside of those working hours to accommodate these new users and also provide support for them. So monitoring the user activity again and making sure that their working patterns haven't changed drastically is absolutely vital. And I guess the final point is to talk about security. Because after we've always put together this wonderful performance infra and move everyone to it, then your CISO comes along and tell you to secure it. And that's when it all goes wrong because usability and security are opposites. That's why you need to build it secure by default. With a remote working environment, your security is more exposed. You don't want to end up in trouble. Myself and fellow CTP, Dave Brett, did a session recently um, about balancing security with usability. We will be doing some updated versions of it because I think it was a great session. But yeah, as I said, build it in by default, then your users won't be impacted by it. Familiarize them with those ways of working, such as MFA or biometrics and smart cards. Block all of that low-hanging fruit if you can. 
block PowerShell, block command prompts, registry editors, FTPs, things like that, browser access to local drives. These are all things that will be used by an attacker to try and move laterally through your environment and find more exploits. For your admins, adopt privileged access workstations. Have that principle of zero trust. Don't have admins logging on as domain admins onto work servers and being able to do whatever they want. Make them do their admin stuff from specific workstations because then you can tell if there's a change, if suddenly somebody starts running RDP from a different area or something like that, what's going on? Also look at how your users, you know, detection is very key. Look at how your users are working. What if Dave from account suddenly starts logging on at three o'clock in the morning and running PowerShell? What's Dave up to? Uh, can't say it too much, but I know Citrix have got a lot of things going on in this space that are going to make those kind of things much, much better. Use those DevOps build processes. They ensure that persistent threats have a short lifespan. If you really need to, reduce that user density if you're in a high security environment, because as I said, security is just as important. And also be aware that COVID-19 has been taken advantage of by attackers looking to exploit that confusion. You need to get involved with things like security analytics from Citrix in order to try and make sure that you're more aware of what's going on in your environment and any potential threats out there. Don't underestimate how important security now is. So after all of that, will, will we ever go back to the traditional office model? A uh, customer I work with saved £7 million in three months on travel costs, and that's net. That's including the cost of the solution. I know that a lot of people have enjoyed the change, although not all. Some people's circumstances or personality mean that they prefer the office model. Well, having said that, I spoke to a guy who worked in India who lived just over 20 miles away from his office, and he told me he had saved eight hours a day in travelling. That is 40 hours of extra spare time a week this guy has now, thanks to remote working. I mean, we've probably saved his life due to avoiding air perturbation personally. Why would you even want to go back to the office in that sort of situation? I think in reality, the new normal will be a mix, a hybrid model. Most people spending their time at home with fortnightly or monthly meetings with teams in the office. There are some things that should never be remote, like virtual conferences. I love to meet people at conferences and talk face to face in groups. For salesmen and people like that as well, you know, maybe they need to meet face to face. But I think for about 80% of us, this hybrid model could be the new normal. As long as we've adapted sufficiently to this way of working, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't go in the office more than 12 to 20 days a year. I may be wrong, but I'd love to see city office blocks abandoned for the most part. And we all move to like little regional hubs that we have and the homeless can have all the offices as new places to live and house prices can even themselves out and things like that. You don't have to move to London to take a job with a company in London, things like that. That might be me being optimistic, but I'd love to say this be the legacy of COVID-19, you know, the improvements for the environment, not having to sit in a commute and things like that and people road raging you. I'd love to say this. Another important note to make is that our DR approach has totally changed. We no longer have backup offices full of computers waiting for people to go in and log on to. That's been completely mothballed. We've saved all that money and this virtual workplace is now our full DR method. So just some key takeaways. Um, never fail to prepare. Don't get caught on the hop again like a lot of us did. Rapid scaling is absolutely key. Build security in by default and constantly get your environment's penetration tested and always be looking to make it better on that score. I want to be the first person in my environment to get 100% score on a penetration test. Network connectivity and keeping those client versions up to date is absolutely paramount. Give your users video tutorials, give them self-help tools, give them access to data. Provide excellent video and audio. And like I've been banging the drum for all along, monitoring is now crucially important. Monitor, 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 to paraphrase Steve Balder. That is probably the most important part of this that I can give to you to take away. Uh, so, thank you for listening to this. I hope this has been useful. Uh, as I said, not really the normal kind of Citrix Converge content, but all of that talk about automation, you know, I'm very proud of that build process we have. I'm looking forward to doing more RPA-based testing and things like that. It's a brave new world out there. And I hope this has allowed you to peer into it a little bit. Thanks very much.